Good afternoon, I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And today, we're adumbrating the first half of Chapter 4 in Meyer's Psychology for AP textbook, Sensation and Perception. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited, so let's get started. So let's get to it. Let's start off with the intro. The first thing that you want to know is that sensation and perception are one process. They're united. We also have two different types of processing. Bottom-up processing involves sensory information. That's how you want to remember it. But it's analysis that begins with sensory receptors and then works its way all the way up to the brain's integration of sensory systems. So receptors to the brain's integration. Top-down processing, you want to remember that by constructing perceptions. And it's information processing in the high level of mental processes, as in, uh, as in when we construct perception. So bottom-up processing is sort of like basic processing, the basic, and then top-down processing moves on to the more abstract. And you can see that showcased in this diagram right here. Now we're going to talk about selective attention. So selective attention is basically focusing your awareness on one thing or another. And a good example of this is the cocktail party effect. Actually, Frank and I like to frequent cocktail parties, and oh, yes. we've noticed that while when we're listening to the rabble of voices, we can hear all those voices speaking at the same time, but we can only process one of those voices at a time. Absolutely. And this diagram also showcases selective awareness. While we can see the cup and the faces, we can't see both at the same time. Well, you can't. I can. No, he can't. I'm special. The idea of inattentional blindness is also important, and that's when we ignore objects when our attention is focused elsewhere. An example of this is when several people were asked to watch a basketball game and to count the number of times players in black jerseys pass the ball. Because of selective inattention and because these people were so focused on counting, they failed to notice the fact that a woman with an umbrella sauntered across the court in the middle of the game. That's inattentional blindness. I would have noticed. Our third, our second type of blindness is change blindness, and it's not noticing changes in the environment. So right here, we have two different pictures, and you probably remember these from your childhood. See, these two different pictures are very similar, but they have subtle changes. See if you can spot some. I, I see one. There's a branch in the first picture, and there isn't one in the second picture, Abe. <laughs> very, very good. Frank. Gotcha. This I'm time. glad you graduated to the first grade. <laughs> Anyways, there's also this idea of threshold, but before we talk about those, it's important to note that psychophysics is studying physical properties of stimuli against psychological experience of these stimuli, and thresholds fall under the category of psychophysics. So an absolute threshold is the minimum stimulation required to detect a stimulus half the time. And it's important to know that absolute thresholds don't stay constant. They vary with age. Our, for example, our sensitivity to high-pitched sounds decreases as we grow older. The signal detection theory predicts when and how we detect faint stimuli. Um, and theorists first want to understand why people tend to respond differently to the same stimuli. And an example of this is the fact that some teachers are much better detecting when a student is cheating on a test. And the second thing they want to understand is why one person's reactions vary as circumstances change, such as why an exhausted parent will hear a faint whim whimper from a baby, but he or she won't hear a louder, unimportant sound. There's also this uh, idea of subliminal stimuli, and those are stimuli that are below our absolute threshold for conscious awareness, but we can still sense them. So we can sense stimuli below our absolute thresholds, but those stimuli, uh, while they're unnoticed, can still affect us. And this, is, this picture shows an example of subliminal stimuli. Sometimes you could flash a, flash a message during a movie, and it will affect us even though we don't know it. But it's important to note that advertisers cannot manipulate us with the so-called hidden persuasion or secret messages of subliminal stimuli. So the key idea here is that we automatically process much of our information out of our conscious mind. So we're not even aware when we're processing information. And the other threshold you want to know about is a difference threshold. While it's similar to the absolute threshold, it's the minimum difference required to detect differences half the time. And this all leads up to Weber's Law, which states that two stimuli must differ by a constant percentage in order to be noticed. In order to be noticed, The amount that they differ by is not important. For example, you probably wouldn't feel a difference between a 296-pound weight and a 300-pound weight, but you would definitely feel a difference between a 4-pound weight and an 8-pound weight. 
So the percentage matters. Even though these two weights only differ by four pounds, the percentage difference is what uh, decides whether we're going to feel a difference between them. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Sensory adaptation is the idea of lessening sensitivity to constant stimulation. An example of this is when we move up a watch on our wrist. We'll feel the difference for only a few, a few minutes, moments. And this is due to the fact that our nerve cells fire less frequently after constant exposure to a stimulus. The fundamental idea here is that we don't perceive the world exactly as it is, but as it is useful for us to perceive it. Mm. And thus, in order to keep our attention, television producers have to use techniques such as sudden noises, edits, zooms, cuts, and pants. Or jump scares in a horror movie. Yeah, sure. Here's a 3D graph of sensory adaptation. It's too advanced for viewers like Frank huh. here. Only nerds understand this stuff. Anyways, I'm sure you guys will understand this. You can see that re response intensity increases uh, increases in the beginning, but it decreases as time, uh, time passes and as repetitions increase. That was actually kind of cool, I have to admit. Okay, but let's look at one of these uh, sensory processing systems in particular, and that's the system of vision, how we see stuff. The, our brain primarily relies on our eyes to receive uh, information about the world around us, and vision works in a couple key ways. First of all, we receive light wavelengths, aka light wavelengths, bouncing off objects that we see. So wavelength is just the distance between waves, and this varying uh, distance is what we call a hue. So a hue is a color, so you know, red, orange, green, blue, purple, those are all decided by the wavelength of light. So we have a graph there showing that as the wavelength gets bigger and bigger, the color gets closer and closer to red. And as it gets smaller and smaller, it gets closer to violet. Now the intensity is the amount of energy. So that's different from wavelength. Wavelength is simply a distance. Intensity is energy. And eyes transduce light energy into action potentials for neurons. So what our eyes are so good at is taking the wavelength and the intensity and putting it into information that our brain can actually understand. So let's take a closer look at that when we look at the eye itself. Unfortunately, this part of the chapter gets kind of dull. Here we have a picture, a basic diagram of what the eye looks like with a couple key systems. So the first one is going to be the cornea. That's the transparent layer forming the front of the eye. It basically protects the other systems inside your eyeball. The second is the pupil. And that's the adjustable opening of the eye. And the iris controls the size of the pupil. Essentially, it's, the iris is kind of like the gatekeeper, the bouncer at the nightclub that is your eye. The iris decides how much light, aka how many light photons, get into your eye. The what if I want more light? You know what? Then your eyes dilate. Because your iris allows the pupil to expand. Um, the lens focuses images on the retina, and the retina is located at the back of the eye. The retina has the rods and cones which allow your eye to process visual information. Rods and cones are simply parts of the eye that do different things in terms of transposing light wavelengths into action potentials for neurons. You can remember their specific uh, goals because cones do, uh, do color, whereas rods do shapes and gray. So Cones, color, CC. That's how I remember it. The optic nerve is simply a nerve that carries info from the eye to your brain. Now let's take a look at visually information processing, which is basically how our brain takes those signals that the eye sends it and changes it into usable information. The first important thing to note here is shape detection or feature detectors, as it's called in the book. And this is simply that specific areas of the brain, specific nerve cells in the brain, respond to specific features of the stimulus, such as shape, angle, movement. So our example there is looking at a bunch of different normal objects and seeing which parts of the brain light up. So that makes sense. When I see Abe's face, it's so ugly that I have a very different response to his face than I would to a house or a chair, which is beautiful by comparison. Another important thing to note, and one of the coolest things that I've learned so far, is parallel processing. Parallel processing is what makes it so that you will always be smarter than a computer. Essentially, when you read that sentence, parallel processing is dope, your brain is looking at more than one thing than just the color, or just the shape, or just the meaning of the words. It's doing all of those at once. A computer, on the other hand, could only look at the shape of the letters, 
then the color, then their meaning, uh, and then other things. You, on the other hand, can look at them all at once and take in the holistic picture. So that's why brains will always be better than computers, because brains can do multiple things at once. Computers act in a sequence rather than in a, in a wave of information. Well, let's move on. Now that we've learned a bit about vision, let's learn about another uh, perception system. All right, we're gonna learn about sound now. Now, as Frank had emphasized, vision is the major sense. It's the most important sense. But it also, it also is important to note that our audition or our sense of hearing is very adaptive. This means that while we can hear a wide range of sounds, the sounds that we hear best are within a frequency range that correspond to that of the human, the, to that of the human voice. There are three basic steps of how we hear. First, we feel vibration, and basically we hear, uh, we hear by both bone and air conduction. Second, the ears transform these vibrations into impulses, and then the brain decodes these impulses, and they become sound. Waves vary in length, frequency, and pitch. So sound waves can be long or short, and they can have different tones. So long waves have low frequency and low pitch, while short waves have high frequency and high pitch. And here's a general picture of an, a wonderful ear with all its parts. Beautiful. Well, that wonderful ear with all its parts will now be dissected by me as I lead you through kind of the ins and outs of the ear. We're not going to go into huge detail here, but we will look at some of the more important aspects. And the first one of those is looking at the outer ear. And that's mainly just, you know, the ear itself. And then, yeah, you know, the ear itself, which serves as kind of a way to capture sound waves. When we look to the middle ear, we kind of see a bunch of different bones, the hammer, the anvil, the eardrum, what's called the stirrup. You don't really need to know the specific uses of those, just know that they're inside the inner ear and they help transduce sound waves. Uh, they help get that down the line to eventually become neural processes for the brain to use. The most important parts lie inside the inner ear, and that's uh, specifically the cochlea. The cochlea translates vibration into neural impulses, so it's the MVP of the ear. The cochlea is kind of like the retina is to the eye. You know, the retina takes light waves and using rods and cones, changes it into action potentials for neurons. That's what the cochlea is for the ear. So think of retina for eye and cochlea for ear. So basically, on the tennis court, I'm the MVP of the court. But when we go to the ear, the cochlea is the MVP of the ear. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day, Abe. But let's move on. All right, there are two types of hearing loss. The first is conduction, and that involves hearing loss caused by damage to the mechanical system that transports sound waves to the cochlea. The second is sensor and neural hearing loss, which involves damage to the cochlea's receptor cells or to the auditory nerves and it's also called nerve deafness. So, if you have nerve, nerve deafness, good news, there's an option for you to fix it. You can get a cochlear implant, as this man has done in that picture. A cochlear implant is a device that is surgically inputted into your ear for the purpose of converting sounds into electric signals and stimulating the auditory nerve. Basically, it restores hearing for people with nerve deafness. Very cool. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and comment down below if you have any questions. And don't forget to visit our website at www.socialscienceindicate.com. As always, we'll catch you guys next time.